started my practice uh, career in New York State, but I did grow up on a farm and my family had cattle and horses. And so that was always a big part of what I wanted to do as a veterinarian. And so I've kept doing both uh, companion animals and then uh, mostly dairy work in New York State, but every state of the United States is uh, so now in South Carolina, I've done a lot more companion animals. So far, I moved down here in June, but I'm working on finding the cows. <laughs> they are around, so still doing a lot of that. And today, I'm really excited to talk to you about uterine prolapses in bovine patients. So I'm going to pull up that PowerPoint in just a minute here. Um, let's see. All right. Um, so. When I started out as a veterinarian, this was one of the emergencies that I was a little bit nervous about <laughs> because I knew that it's life-threatening for a cow or a buffalo to have a uterine prolapse and that you had to kind of put down whatever you were working on and go to that farm for the best prognosis for that patient. And it's also a really big problem. So um, I'm going to see if I can advance the slides here. Should be a little bit frozen, so <laughs> there we go. Um, so uterine prolapse is quite large. As you can see, this is a Holstein dairy cow in the United States, uh, very different from a vaginal prolapse. And uh, uterine prolapse, it goes almost all the way to the hocks most of the time. You can see that here, um, it's all the way down here. A vaginal prolapse, you might see a little bulge of tissue from the vulva. Um, and it is not an emergency. Uh, so it's important to ask some questions of the farmer that's calling you to figure out which one you have. Sometimes they will call a vaginal prolapse, a uterine prolapse. Um, but again, you can see here that they're very distinctive from each other. So when a producer calls you with this problem, you can tell them to start by um, putting the cow in a position where she's not going to damage that uterus any farther. You want to put the uterus on a, either a plastic sheet, a blanket, a tarp, um, and get it cleaned off. They can use warm water. Um, sometimes Epsom salts can be good as well, uh, but nothing, no detergents. You don't want them to use soap. Uh, you don't want to damage those really sensitive vessels on the surface. Uh, of the uterus. And so if they can get it cleaned up and kind of elevated, so if the cow is downhill with her, her rump downhill, you want to move her so that uh, gravity is on your side. Um, the more that that uterus is pulling, the more compromised it will be. So when you arrive at the farm, um, you know, you want to certainly examine the cow, but before we get into treatment of that, I just wanted to mention a couple of the predisposing factors for uterine prolapse. One of the big ones here in the United States is overweight cattle. Uh, you may not see that quite as often in India, I'm not sure, but overweight cattle, uh, those that are confined. So this is an image of a tie stall barn in New York. Uh, this is a model of dairy farming where the cattle stay in the barn all year. Uh, they stay in their own stall, they eat there, they get milked there. Uh, and that kind of system really does predispose cattle to a uterine prolapse. They just muscle tone uh, and they also usually are at a slope downhill. And so that's a disadvantage to them. Uh, third one down, cattle that have had multiple cows or multiple calves, excuse me, multiparous are more at risk for a prolapse. And then of course the last two, if a cow has had a very difficult delivery, they can use up a lot of their calcium with muscle contractions. And so uh, they simply don't have enough muscle tone to keep that uterus in place after the calf is delivered. Uh, and that brings up a good point that usually a prolapse will only occur within the first 24 hours after calving. Hopefully that farmer calls you in the first couple hours uh, I've certainly been called for a few that were far too late. Uh, even if they wait 12 or 14 hours, that uterus is really compromised with, by weather, uh, by trauma from other cattle, if there are other cattle standing nearby. And so the sooner they can call you, certainly the better prognosis for the cow. 
So to start for treatment, <laughs> um, the biggest thing is to get the cow or buffalo into a position that makes this job a little bit easier for you and for the helpers with you. Uh, this cow in the image here is in a, in a position that is the easiest, in my opinion, for replacing a uterus. Of course, you can imagine a really uh, just cow or buffalo would be difficult to get down into this position. You can use a casting rope. You see that's what's on the front of this cow. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that technique. I should have put some images in um, on how to use a casting rope with pressure points on a cow to help her lay down. Um, but if a cow's already down, you, you have the legs, hind legs extended here. Um, and then the uterus only has to be elevated about a foot uh, or I guess uh, a meter uh, to get the uterus to the level of the ischium or hips uh, so that it's easier to replace. And so uh, after you've gotten the cow in that position, definitely uh, take a listen to the heart rate of the cow. Uh, check that she's stable. Oftentimes cows that have had a prolapse for a long period of time are in shock and you'll need to do IV fluids before even trying to replace the prolapse. If you jump right to putting that prolapse in, that cow might die while you're doing it uh, in that way. And unfortunately you've wasted your effort. Um, so you, again, you have to make sure that that cow is stable. Sometimes uh, veterinarians here will do calcium, 23% uh, calcium in a 500 milliliter solution. They'll do that first, the first thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's up to your, your discretion. If that cow is stable, the IV fluids can wait until after you put that uterus back in. So after you have the cow in this position, uh, you will have a much easier time <laughs> putting this back in if you have an epidural. So I'll go, I'll go through the epidural. I know some of you will be used to this technique and have done it before. To some of you, it seems intimidating. Um, so I like Dr. Paul said, we'll have time for questions at the end. I'll do my best to explain it. It is a technique that is easiest to learn, um, I think in person with somebody showing you on a cow exactly how to do this, but at least I can describe for you um, what I've been taught and what works works well for me in the field. So to find the proper location for an epidural in a cow, the easiest thing is to grab the tail with one of your hands and move the tail upward and feel with your other hand that position on the cow's back where you have a stationary, um, the stationary sacrum versus where you're move, moving the vertebra of the tail. And that is typically between those two vertebrae that you're feeling right here, um, where you're going to place your needle. And you need a needle that's at least an inch and a half. I apologize for <laughs> US measurements. I'm not sure how your needles are um, marketed to you, but an inch and a half here, two inches is appropriate. And you can see here, so this in, in this image, the cow's tail would be over here cow's head would be over here. Um, and so you'll put a small amount of lidocaine in the hub of the needle. And as you advance that needle through the dura of the spinal cord, the negative pressure will pull in that lidocaine. So it's a good indicator that you're in the correct epidural space. So again, a little bubble of lidocaine in the hub of the needle. And as you advance it, it should get sucked in to the epidural space. Um, once you're there, you can attach the syringe. Usually, so down here, I have some uh, doses here. A big cow, you may need more like six to eight milliliters of lidocaine. Um, but for a smaller cow, definitely start more at four to five milliliters. Uh, and of course, these first two steps are also important. You want to make sure this is a sterile area. Of course, you're going into the water. Certainly don't want to introduce any kind of bacteria or debris. Um, so I hope that makes sense um, to all of you. And again, I know it's intimidating if you've never done that before. Um, but thankfully, cattle are tough. You know, I've done this and had a part of an epidural that works not not as well, and then repeated it and had it work just fine. Um, so if you wait five minutes and you lift that tail up and you still have some tone.
you know, you didn't do that epidural quite quite right. And so you can go back and um, administer a, a few more milliliters, usually three milliliters more of lidocaine. And I wouldn't repeat it more than that, but hopefully that can work for you because once you get to this scenario here, you don't want the cow pushing against you. So if you have the epidural placed correctly, uh, the cow will not contract as you're putting that uterus back in. Um, and it's also pain, um, much less pain for them, which is very important. So the next step is to remove the placenta from the placentomes. So in these two images, the placenta has already been removed. Uh, you can kind of peel it back gently from each placentome here. Um, and it, I know it's, I've said that you want to put this in as quickly as you can, but you certainly don't want to cause any more trauma by rushing and, and ripping the placenta off. So kind of gently peel, like you would peel off a sticker. Um, and then once you've gotten the placenta removed, you rinse the uterus again uh, with some warm water. You can use a dilute iodine solution as well if you are in a dirty situation, um, which I have been many times sitting in a, a pile of mud or um, manure <laughs> and trying to put one of these back in. You really want to try to be as clean as possible. Uh, the other thing to remember is if you are sitting behind a cow that's laying down in that position we talked about before, you have the, the uterus in your lap. And so you definitely wanna have that sheet underneath it and keep it nice and clean. Um, the other thing that can really help shrink the size of the uterus is sugar. Um, so here I would typically use about um, well, five pounds. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure about the conversion there, but quite a bit of sugar on the surface of the uterus to take out that edema. The osmotic effect is pretty impressive. Uh, you could probably take about at least a third of the size of that away, third of the size of the uterus away by using sugar. Uh, some veterinarians here don't, don't really like that method because they feel that the sugar inside the uterus, once you've replaced it, encourages metritis. Uh, but we'll go through later uh, why I found that it, it still works for me. Um, but again, we'll have questions at the end and we can have a discussion about what uh, has worked for each of you in your practice. Um, but putting on sugar, uh, again, like I said, it shrinks, shrinks it to about two thirds of its size. And then you can start with the replacement of the uterus. And now this is tricky. Um, usually you start right next to the cervix here. And you definitely don't wanna keep your hands open. Um, kind of a closed fist is good. And then, or you can cup your hands. Um, but if you're keeping your fingers spread out, that small amount of um, the pinpoint pressure on the uterus can certainly cause tears. Um, if that uterus has been out, like I said, for more than 10 hours or so, it's very, very delicate. And this can be a really frustrating job if you're causing trauma <laughs> while you're doing it. So keep a closed fist or cupped hand. Now, I did include this picture of a water buffalo on the right side. Um, I actually did have a water buffalo farm in New York State, about uh, 30 milking water buffalo, and they had plenty of calves as well. And I also did research uh, in Hyderabad on buffalo. So I know that they are different, <laughs> uh, certainly different altogether from a, a calm dairy cow. Um, but this is, would be good restraint for a buffalo that doesn't want to lay down over here. And so, if they're standing, you can use a plank or you know a firm piece of plastic to have two people hold that uterus up to the level of the hips. Um, and that way, the gravity is not working against you as you're trying to put that uterus in. Um, and for a, a buffalo that's standing, you can still do the epidural uh, that will still help you. And the buffalo may not, may not lay down, um, but it certainly reduces the pain of replacing that uterus. Uh, you can also give sedative medication to help you uh, with a non-compliant buffalo. So if you've gone through this process and you did, I mean, whether there was a hole in the uterus before you started or you caused one um, by trying to push it back in, you can get out your suture and replace uh, and repair repair any lacerations. So usually the best 
Suture pattern is an inverting one. Uh, here I have an image of a Cushing pattern here. So you're taking a bite of tissue kind of parallel to a, a laceration on each side. Um, suture that's good is anything that's monofilament and absorbable. Um, we, we do use cat gut suture in the United States and cattle. Um, that can cause some extra inflammation, but it is a suture that's less expensive um, and it does very well in most cases. So after you've fixed your lacerations, you can do one, um, one line of sutures. Sometimes veterinarians here will do two just to be sure that that's going to hold. Um, you can, again, clean off that uterus and replace it. Uh, this image on the right is to bring up a point about additional organs prolapsed within the uterus. You can see here that this buffalo prolapse is enormous, uh, much larger than the images we saw before. Uh, and so definitely suspect in this case that there's a bladder prolapsed in that uterus. You can also have intestines, uh, colon. It, uh, and of course, that's a much more complicated scenario. Um, if you can find the urethral orifice to the bladder, you can catheterize it and empty it. Um, I have had a buffalo with this very similar prolapse and actually had to drain the bladder using a syringe and a needle um, because we couldn't catheterize it. Certainly not as ideal as using a catheter. Um, but this is all the time to warn the farmer that with a prolapse this big, you could have the uterine vessels and arteries so stretched that once you replace the uterus, that cow will die um, because the, those vessels have ruptured uh, from being stretched so far. Um, and that's, that's happened to me too. You know, I've spent hours putting one of these back in. Cow stands up and then she bleeds out, unfortunately. Um, so it's something that you don't want to tell the farmer it's 100% success rate putting one of these back in because there are are many complications. And unfortunately, this right here in this image uh, is one of them. <clears throat> Other, uh, the last one here, necrosis. Uh, in New York State, it got very cold, uh, certainly below zero degrees centigrade. Um, and if a uterus is out in that kind of temperature, of course, it can have frostbite, uh, lots of damage especially, and even in hot climates too, um, you have flies and any trauma from surrounding cattle, and that can cause irre irreversible necrosis of the uterus. And so if you're presented with an issue like this one, um, where you have necrosis or you have way too many organs in that prolapse and you can't fix it, uh, in the United States, often we would use euthanasia um, I know that that's not an option to many of you. Um, and so there is a salvage procedure for a hysterectomy. I'm gonna kind of skip ahead to that and I'll go back. Um, so hysterectomy in cattle, certainly uh, probably about a 20% success rate for a long lifetime for a cow. Usually in the United States, we're using this to um, keep a cow alive and comfortable to go to slaughter, which again, I know is not a, not an option uh, in India. So, but cows can live with an appropriate hysterectomy for a longer period of time, but of course they will never have a calf again and be bred back. Uh, so I'll go through two methods. I have one kind of in text here on the slide, uh, but there is a second, a second method as well. So the first method is to use a circumferential umbilical tape or latex tubing around the base of the uterus, just, um, just caudal to the cervix. And so uh, using the tubing, you can kind of tighten it as you would um, tighten uh, any, any suture, but of course this is a huge uterus. Um, so sometimes veterinarians will place um, two ligatures, not just one. Um, so as you tighten that, you can then put throws to um, if you have any kind of hemorrhage, you want to ligate those vessels, um, and then you transect, you transect the whole uterus um, six to nine centimeters away from that tubing. So obviously that's a huge, huge procedure, lots of complications. 
Um, the other method for a hysterectomy in a cow is to actually ligate each individual horn. Um, but I do want you to kind of picture in your mind for a second how big that uterus is after calving. So you have one of the horns had that calf in it. So it's, you're thinking 12, 15 centimeters, maybe more in diameter. Uh, and the other horn is obviously smaller, but uh, some veterinarians do like to ligate and transect the individual horns so that it's a smaller amount of tissue to replace into the, the pelvic cavity. Um, again, the, the technique here would certainly be to put a, a circumferential suture around each of those horns and then uh, use additional suture for hemostasis. Um, certainly this, uh, we do have to think about um, humane treatment of the cow though in this scenario. Uh, if done incorrectly, it can cause chronic pain or certainly complications that would lead to the death of a cow. So again, it's not, not commonly done in the United States, but, uh, and I, I personally have never done this, um, but it can work for a short period of time. But let's go back to the good scenario where everything went well for you. And uh, if you've gotten that uterus back in, uh, the cow's comfortable, there are a couple ways to make sure you've gotten that uterus replaced completely. Um, because we know that if, if you put that uterus back in, but one of the horns is slightly inverted, the cow will try to push the uterus back out again. And so you want to straighten those horns either with manual reduction using your hands um, within the uterus to straighten each horn. Uh, or the method I like because we have some really big uh, Holsteins here. They're so big that my arm can't reach the tip of those horns um, that I use warm water instead. So here's a pump here. We would put a hose into the uterus, usually about 12 to 15 liters of water. It weights the uterus and stretches out the tips of those horns uh, so that the uterus is in its correct position. And you can leave that water there. The cow will eventually um, involute its uterus and the water will come out. Uh, it also helps to dilute that sugar that I was talking about earlier, and that's helpful. And so other really important things um, to remember here would be the pain management for the cow. And I know we've done an epidural already, but that typically only lasts for a few hours. Um, so we need to use some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory for pain, pain ma management. Uh, and I know there should well, there will probably be some differences again in what's available to you. Typically in the United States, uh, the, the least expensive option is aspirin. And so uh, we have bolus aspirin here, five grams per bolus, or excuse me, 15.5 grams. Um, we usually give three of those to a cow orally. Um, what I like to use is called vanamine, a flunixin megalamine injection, IV. That lasts for 24 hours. It's a great, um, uh, very fast acting um, pain relief. And then Dr. Benjamin tells me you do have meloxicam. Um, again, that's, we, we have it available here as a tablet and as an injection, but mostly used in companion animal. Uh, we don't have a label for cattle use. And so uh, legally we're, we're to use more banamine and aspirin, which are marketed for cattle. So after you've given pain medication, the other step is to give oxytocin. And this is key. It's a really big part of the presentation. Oxytocin is your tool to get that uterus to track down and stay within the pelvic cavity. Um, now, if you're close enough to calving within that 24 hour window, oxytocin should work. Now, usually within 12 hours is best, but, and again, this dose here, two and a half to five milliliters of uh, this concentration of oxytocin um, is appropriate and you give that intramuscularly and it can really, you know, it helps that uterus stay in. It can um, also remove debris that's within the, the, the lumen of the uterus, all that water and uh, sugar and I'm sure a little bit of dirt from when you replaced it. Even if we try to be clean, there's always some um, bacteria in there and then that, um, in that vein, talking about metritis is important. So 
anytime you have a prolapse, you're going to have an infection. Um, any kind of broad spectrum antibiotic that you have uh, that's appropriate for cattle should be used. Again, here in the United States, we typically use a Ceftiafir class of antibiotic. It's broad spectrum. We have a lot of them labeled for cattle and buffalo. And then uh, I know you have penicillin available. That one is not quite as broad spectrum, of course, as a Ceftiafir, but if that's what you have, certainly you can use it. Um, the important thing about penicillin here is that we have a very long uh, withhold time for milk. You know, that's something that would prevent a farmer from selling the milk from that animal. And so we typically avoid it. Um, and so the last thing is to recheck that patient three days after you've put that prolapse in. Um, they can certainly have other complications from being down a long time. You know, a big heavy cow and uh, down with a prolapse could have other muscle damage and uh, joint damage. Um, if the cow was low in calcium and that's what caused the prolapse, may need repeat treatment of calcium. Um, usually not just day three, but you might have that farmer give a calcium supplement uh, the, the, day, the two days following the replacement of the prolapse. And I already talked about that hysterectomy again. <laughs> uh, hysterectomy is not, not a great option, but if it's the only thing left to you and that farmer really wants to try to save the cow it is something um, that has been done. And kind of back to where we started here, I just wanted to touch on vaginal prolapse in cows and buffalo because you'll have farmers get confused and they're very different, different in prognosis and different in their predisposing factors. Um, so it definitely vaginal prolapse is not an emergency. And we see this more commonly in some of our beef breeds here, Herefords, um, but it does happen in dairy animals as well. It has a genetic tie to it. So if you have a cow that has prolapsed, a vaginal prolapse once, uh, it, it is a good recommendation to have that farmer breed other animals if possible, not that one, um, because she'll keep repeating the, the prolapse in future calving, um, prior to future calvings. And so vaginal prolapse usually happens um, a couple of weeks before a calf is born. That's another important difference. And you do want to actually use sutures to keep the, the vaginal prolapse in if the vaginal tissue is becoming damaged. Sometimes you'll have a prolapse that's quite large. And if that cow, even if the prolapse goes back in when that cow uh, stands up, which is also common, uh, you want to use a, a suture in the vulvar tissue to keep the prolapse in. Uh, I didn't include images or a description of that because we're focusing more on a uterine prolapse. But um, again, did want to, want to explain the difference. Um, here in the United States, again, it's more common in overconditioned or overweight animals. All right. I probably went through that a little bit faster. <laughs> than I should have, but that leaves us with a lot of time for questions and I can certainly go back and re-explain something that was not clear. So at this time, if you have a question, um, please feel free to ask it or you can use that chat box that Dr. Dixon was telling us about. Um, so what questions do you have? Yeah, this is the time for questions. I mean, you can either you can ask directly to Dr. Gretchen, otherwise you can put in the chat box. If you want to know more, more about vaginal prolapse also, you can ask. So whatever that comes into mind, you can ask that. This is a good time. Can you please uh, throw some light on the prepartum prolapse? Prepartum prolapse. And what are the drugs can be used in there? Okay. Prepartum prolapse. Prepartum prolapse. Not Pre -partum prolapse. Uh, usually not. Uh, certainly what uterine. Are, oh, is that not the question? Drugs of choice you can use your mother. 
here. I'm going to, uh, if you can try typing your question in the chat box, it's a little bit hard to hear. I mean, he wants to know what is the drugs of choice for prepartum prolapse. Okay. So again, with the prepartum prolapse, it's typically a vaginal one. And so no, you want to be careful with use of any medication because you of that calf uh, still uh, being in the uterus. And so usually it's just a manual um, reduction of the prolapse. So you push that vaginal prolapse back in. Um, if it's close enough to term, you know, close enough to the delivery date for the animal, you can induce, um, induce parturition with, with hormones. Um, is that something that you, I mean, I can describe that as well. Typically here we would use, uh, dexamethasone, um, to induce parturition. but usually no, no other drugs unless that cow is right, you know, right at term, you, ready to use. Duroprojan, get. injection product. Duroprojan, progesterone. All right, Dr. Dixon, you might have to tell me that one too. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Right. Francis is saying that progesterone hormone, can it be given? Yes, you can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Um may not help, you know, again, the prolapse is usually an anatomical issue in that cow and not a hormonal one. Um, and so even with hormone treatment, you, you will not reduce the vaginal prolapse without actually pushing it in manually. Um, now there is a question in the chat box here about vaginal prolapse and uterine prolapse and small ruminants. Um, I have never seen it myself. Um, I know it certainly vaginal prolapse does exist in small ruminants. Um, the, the treatment for it is very much the same as with cattle. You'll just use a much smaller needle for suturing the vulva and, and keeping that vaginal prolapse in. I can't speak to the uterine prolapse because I've never seen it. Okay, there's another good question in the chat box. Um, so for, for uterine prolapse, I'll try to type my answer and talk at the same time. <laughs> um, for uterine prolapse, you do not need a retention suture in the vulva. And that's because um, if you think about how much tissue is there, even with the suture that cow wants to push out the uterus again, she will, you know, she'll push it through a hole this big or one that's the normal size of the vulva and cervix. Uh, and that's why getting that uterus completely back to its normal position is so important. If you have even just the tip of the horn inverted, that cow will try to push the uterus out again. But if you put it back correctly, uh, you shouldn't need, shouldn't need any sutures in the vulva. Okay, uh, next question. These are great questions. Thank you. Um, this is great. So uh, what, what would you advise to avoid recurrence of a prolapse? Um, the good news about a uterine prolapse is that there is no predisposition for prolapsing again. Um, usually it's, like I said, it's due to um, having low calcium or the way a cow is confined. So certainly you can avoid those predisposing factors of keeping a cow tied up. You want to keep that cow up and walking. Um, so avoiding recurrence really is to take away as many of those variables that would predispose the cow as possible. Um, so getting that cow into the proper body condition um, is, is key. So, um, but again, kind of contrasting it with the vaginal prolapse, the vaginal prolapse is more genetic, and so to avoid the recurrence is near impossible. But with uterine, uh, it's not likely to happen again. I've actually never seen it um, more than twice in a cow. Okay. Uh, 
A good question here. It's apart from metritis, what are the other post-prolapse complications and treatment? Um, one of the post-complications would be if you had um, a small tear in the uterine wall, you can have a peritonitis. Uh, so a, any kind of contamination of that abdominal cavity. Um, cows are, again, I, I don't know if I've said it yet, but I think they're probably one of the more amazing animals in that they can wall off a lot of those infections um, with fibrin, but really uh, the antibiotic medications are really important at the time of replacing that prolapse so that even if you had a small, um, small tear in the uterus, that that would treat the peritonitis as well. Um, other complications, again, chronic pain in a dairy animal can really reduce their milk production. Um, so it would be good to advise a farmer um, to continue with pain, pain medication if possible, whether it's the aspirin or meloxicam, can really get that cow comfortable enough to eat, eat more and produce more milk. Um, all right, we have another question here too. And if, if that, if any of those answers uh, aren't quite clear enough, just let me know. Hopefully everybody, I know I've talked a little bit quickly, but I can slow down as well. Um, okay, there's another question here. What is the dose of lidocaine used for epidural for correction of uterine prolapse? Um, well, here, here we usually use 2% lidocaine same with, if you have lignocaine, it is the same. Um, and you're going to use five milliliters of that undiluted for a small cow for an epidural. Uh, and if you have a large cow, you can use up to eight milliliters. Here, I'll, I'll type that out though, just so we have it. Any other questions so far? Okay, uh, this question was here we use salt to reduce the size of an enlarged prolapse. Um, what else can we use? So salt or Epsom salts does work, um, but as I talked about before, uh, granulated sugar or glycerol. How about using sugar, madam, instead of salt? Sugar. What, what kind of sugar? Uh, white sugar. White sugar. Mm -hmm. In villages, we use that. All right, sorry, one more time. I turned up my volume. We use in the villages when we don't get some uh, this drugs and all. Okay, um, Dr. Dixon, can you help me out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, uh, Dr. Francis says that can sugar be used for to reduce the size of the you know the uterus? Sugar is very commonly available in the village. Yes. But uh, Dr. Ajay has said that sugar will cause a bacterial growth. You see the chat box? It can. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Also, which is a better one, whether sugar or uh, salt? Maybe that's a question. I use sugar more. But okay. Um, There is another question in the chat box. Okay. Or um, yeah. a good one. 
boluses for intrauterine yeast are not as common in the United States anymore. They've put a lot of restrictions, but you can use iodine if you have that. But in the stomach antibiotics do most of the work uh, for preventing. Uh, any more questions you can ask? Anything you want to know about more detail or such? Suppose in case of the uterine tear, if you repair it, what is the successful rate? The success rate is good. Um, good. If, you, if you repair that, um, repair it appropriately and that there's no hemorrhage. So a big complication is bleeding. If you have a tear that you have sutured correctly, you should stop that bleeding. Uh, and again, like I said before, cattle are great at healing. And if you've gotten that uterus in correctly, um, you should have a good, good prognosis. All right, there's another question here. Um, so uh, I do, we don't use that technique um, very often. So I'm talking about the question here at the bottom of the chat box. Um, instead we use, that's what we use the oxytocin for. Uh, so the cow actually cleanses her own uterus with contractions and the, and the involution of the uterus. I'll type that in. Um, all right, so are you able to see the question in the chat box? Shall I read it for you? So the last question was what amount of, what amount of sugar do we use? Um, so you're not making a solution, you're actually pouring that sugar, the granulated sugar, dry sugar, straight onto the uterus. Um, if you mixed it with water, then it would negate the effect. So you want to put dry sugar directly onto the uterus. Um, here in the United States, it's sold in a five pound bag, um, which let me see, I could try to do that conversion <laughs> quickly, but it's quite a few kilograms of of sugar. Let's see. So that would be about 2.5 kilograms of sugar. All right. Okay, a good question. Uh, that last one there about using calcium, boroglucanate, IV, and sub Q. Um, that, that is appropriate. Again, if you have a really large cow, um, you may want to focus on doing IV calcium instead of putting one sub Q. Of course, you can over, over, overdose calcium, um, so you want to be careful with that. But if you have a cow that is so low in calcium that she's not standing, uh, usually it takes two, two bottles of 23% calcium, and a bottle here is 500 milliliters. Um, so... The boroglucanate, uh, again, that's uh, that's just fine. It would be sufficient. Um, we don't typically do that here. We use dextrose, um, but same idea. 
So I, I certainly agree. Definitely use calcium um, and dextrose if that cow needs to have a little bit more energy if she hasn't been eating. <laughs> 